Thank you so much for joining us. We hope this ministry has touched you and we'd love to hear your story. So please contact us at stories at edgewaterchurch.com. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can go on edgewaterchurch.com and choose the giving button that works best for you. Again, thank you and prepare your hearts for today's message. How many of you already have your shopping done? Anybody? All right, quite a few. How many of you still have some shopping left to do? I'm going to put up both hands on that. Uh, <laughs> um, how, how many of you have already finished your shopping for next year? <laughs> I had one guy do that last night, and I was like, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. It, it, was, it was very impressive. Well, uh, when I asked about uh, that still have shopping to do, I did see a lot of male hands up there. And so just as a public service for the husbands out there, I just want to drop a little uh, Christmas shopping advice on you to help you out this morning. Um, first thing, when you buy a gift for your wife, um, just keep the receipt, all right? Um, and, and it's not that she's picky. You just don't have very good taste. So... Um, <laughs> And she did not email me and ask me to tell you that. Um, second thing, if you're doing a special scavenger hunt with like clues that, that lead to the ultimate gift, don't let the ultimate gift be a vacuum cleaner. Okay? I'm, I'm just saying. Not going to score any points that way. Um, try not to buy clothing in any sizes because inevitably you're going to get it wrong and you will pay a price, my friend. Um, so um, don't buy anything that has to do with weight loss or self-improvement. Um, <laughs> Wait till the new year, wait till she asks, and then maybe you could do that then. Save yourself the headache. Um, and finally, don't buy jewelry. Now, I know the women are going, wait, don't tell them that. Come on now. Um, but here's the thing. Guys, what she wants, you can't afford. <laughs> and what you can afford, she doesn't really want. So, um, so I hope I've saved you all a little bit of trouble this Christmas. Um, we, we are here for you. Um, all right, so we are, we're in the middle of a, a series right now called The King is Coming. And uh, when, when you think about a king or someone of great importance coming or arriving, what, what do you normally think of? You think of people bringing them gifts as a, as a welcome. We are so glad that you're here. And, and the, that, that person ends up receiving these gifts. We want to give gifts to honor them. But when Jesus came, he didn't come expecting gifts. He doesn't need anything from us. Jesus came to give gifts to us. And, and so far through this series, we've talked about three of those gifts. In the first week of the series, we talked about the gift of hope. And that God is the only one who is worthy of our hope, of, of us putting our hope in him. Because he's the only one who has the power to deal with whatever it is that we're dealing with. And he's also the only one, I mean, he has this incredible and amazing love for us. And that if there's any time that we need to be reminded of that hope, of where we can put our hope, we just need to look at the cross. Because it's in the cross we see displayed his power and his love all there in one place. In the second week of the series, we talked about uh, the, how we can experience the gift of peace that comes from the Prince of Peace. And we talked about some things that we, we, we may need to do to help us to experience that peace more fully. That we need to receive God's pardon. That we need to run to God's presence because it's in his presence we're going to find peace. That we need to respect God's principles. Because so often when we're, when we're disobedient, we're, we're dealing with guilt and shame. And, and so when we respect his principles, it gives us a sense of peace. And then we need to rely on God's provision, trusting that he's going to take care of our needs. Then last week, we talked about the gift of joy that Jesus came to, to bring us. Uh, we talked about the difference between happiness and joy. We talked about how happiness is, is based on what happens to you. And yet joy is what is produced in you. Uh, we talked about how happiness is inconsistent. It's a moving target. The things that make me happy now are not necessarily the things that made me happy before and are not necessarily the things that will make me happy later. And it's just exhausting to try to keep up with that. Yet joy is confident and consistent. And then we talked about how happiness is, is dictated by the facts, but joy is defined by God's truth. So today we're going to spend some time talking about the gift of love. Um, when, what, what comes to mind when you think of the word love? Because it's kind of, a, kind of a tricky word, multifaceted. There are lots, of, lots and lots of layers to it. Um, 
It even seems like there's a little bit of a different definition, even like from generation to generation. Um, it seems like in my, not to paint them all with the, uh, the same brush, but it seemed like by and large in my grandparents' generation um, that love was, was, was steadfast and consistent. Uh, it might have been stoic and not very emotional, but, but it was faithful. In the boomer generation, by and large, a lot of folks see love as provision. We're going to provide a better future for our family than we had. They didn't necessarily know how to express it in words, but, but, um, but they showed love by providing. Generation X folks tend to spell love T-I-M-E. Uh, they, they show love by spending time with each other, and that's, that's something that's very important. And then the next generation that's come along, the, the millennials, I, I asked a couple of them this week how, how their generation expresses love. Because it seems like it, it's a little more freely flowing, um, but a lot of it is social media based. And through Snapchat and retweets and likes and, and those types of things kind of define what love is in, in the millennial generation. So, so the word carries lots of different meanings um, depending on your perspective. It's the only word in the English language that can be used to describe your feelings for your mom, your favorite team, and pizza. So the dictionary defines love this way. It's a strong feeling of affection and concern toward another person based on kinship or close friendship. So it's, it's feelings for others based on something. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's because you're related to me. Maybe it's because you make me feel a certain way. Maybe it's because um, you add certain value to my life. L love is something that's based on a feeling. The problem with that, as you and I well know, is that feelings change over time. Uh, sometimes they, they, they fade. And, and so when we think of love in those terms, then we're not really fully understanding this, this love that God has for us this Christmas season. And, and so let's take a little bit of time to look at this gift of love that Jesus brought at Christmas time. I think one of the best verses to describe it is found in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, where it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. This gift of love expressed in Jesus that he came to bring us is unlike any love that you have ever known. One, one of the first things that we need to know about God's love is that God's love is inclusive. It's inclusive. Um, God's gift of love is meant for everyone. It, it, it wasn't just meant for the people of Israel, although back in that day they probably thought that it was, that God was coming to, to, to bring love to them, but God's love is far greater than that. His love is intended for everyone, that every, every tongue, every tribe, every nation would be able to experience God's love. Even at its best, human love is not inclusive. We, we just don't have the resources to love everybody. I know, I know we can offhandedly say, oh, well, I love everybody. But I tell you what, I bet if we started going down the list, there would be a line somewhere that you would finally go, okay, yeah, maybe not them. It's because that, we just don't have, it's kind of like uh, your Christmas list right? You, you may have a big family, friends, all these folks on this list, and there is a line somewhere. And the person above the line gets a gift, the person below the line does not, okay? And so that's kind of the way it is with, with human love. We, we don't have the resources to be able to love everybody. But I tell you what, there is no cutoff on God's Christmas list. You know, his, his gift of love is inclusive. In John three 16, let's read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. For this is how God loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Two key words here. What does it say? It says, for God so loved the what? The world. Everybody. It is a big place. It, it is inclusive. And then it, and, and it says that he gave his one and only son so that who? Everyone. 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 It is all inclusive. God's gift of love is all inclusive. This probably would have been a little bit of a shocking message for the people of Israel. They knew that a savior was coming um, and that he would bring love and redemption for them. But Jesus brought it out to the world, to everyone. Think about the Christmas story. When the angels came to bring the news about Jesus, do you remember who they came to? The shepherds. They came to the shepherds. What's interesting about that is that according to the religious law of the day, by virtue of what the shepherds do, they would have been considered unclean. And they would have not been allowed to go to the temple or worship because of the, their handling of animals. 
So you'd think that when the announcement of Jesus' birth would be made, it would start with the king. It would start at the top, and that would be where the main announcement, and maybe, maybe the priests and religious leaders, and then it would just kind of trickle downhill, and then maybe eventually news would get to the shepherds. But that's not how it happened. The news came first to the shepherds, which gives us a picture of the inclusive nature of God's love. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and you've wondered if God could really love you. I hope you have your answer today. That, that if you are part of everyone, which we all are, that you are included. That there is a gift of love from God that has your name on it. Take a minute to think here this morning. Is there anyone in your life that needs to be included? Included in your plans for Christmas? Included by sharing God's gift of love for them? Maybe there's someone in your life who, who needs to know that they are on God's Christmas list. That his love is available to everyone. At Edgewater, we are an inclusive church. We recognize that each and every one of us has issues. In fact, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I have issues. <laughs> yeah, last night that took about 20 minutes. I think people started breaking up into group therapy sessions as we, as we started going. Um, but you know, that's what kind of church you're in right now. Okay, nobody's perfect. Nobody in those chairs, certainly nobody up on this platform. And God's love is for all of us. As we get ready to celebrate Christmas, we're going to be offering three Christmas Eve services. And we're going to be presenting the gospel at all three of those services. So maybe there are some people in your life who need to be included by you inviting them to come and sit with you on Christmas Eve. So God's love is inclusive. There's a second thing that I think we can learn about God's love and uh, and I'm going to illustrate it this way. Um, anybody have a dog? Any, any dog folks out here? Yeah, lot, lots of dog folks here. Um, dogs have this crazy kind of love. If you have a dog, you kind of know how it goes. Um, you, you wake up in the morning, you put them out, you feed them, and then you head off to work. Now, I don't think that dogs know how to tell time, but they, but they just have a sense about when you're coming home. Okay? But let's say that this day you happen to have a meeting after work. And then you had to get gas on the way home. And then you stopped to get something to eat. And then you finally get home. I'll tell you what. If it was your spouse waiting on the other side of the door with you coming home an hour or two later than expected, there might be a tough conversation waiting for you there. But I'll tell you what. If you open that door and it is your dog there, what's going on? Barking and jumping and tail wagging and maybe a little pee-pee on the floor because they're just so excited that you're there. They're, they're so excited to see you. That's the nature of dogs. You know, now, now God's love is so much bigger and wider and deeper than all that. But to me, the, the, that kind of love is representative of the word unconditional. And so God's gift of love for us is unconditional. It's unconditional. Sometimes it's a little hard for us as, as limited human beings to, to wrap our brains around unconditional love. We, we understand passionate love and young love and falling in love and first love. But unconditional love is hard for us to grasp. It's a love that's not based on anything. It's not, it's not earned. It's not going to go away. It's not going to fade. God's love did not start with our behavior because we, we, we did something right. And it can't be taken away from us. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 verse 8 where it says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Before we cleaned up our act. Before we got anything right. That's when God's love for us started. And, and, and that love can't be ended by us either. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 and then continuing on in 38 and 39 says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And he goes on to say, I am convinced that nothing, let me hear you say nothing. Amen. Nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing, let me hear you say nothing. Amen. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is, 
that is good news. You, you can hear Paul getting to preaching there. He, he, he's on a roll because it's so important because he wants us to understand that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Nothing you can do, nothing that can be done to you that can separate you from God's love. God's love is unconditional. It's hard for us to understand. But the reality is, is that each of us was born with a desire to be loved like this. And, and that's why when we're let down by people who are supposed to love us, that's why it hurts so deeply. Be, because we were created to be loved unconditionally. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm such, a, such a proud dad. I've been blessed with two incredible children. I'm constantly amazed at how awesome they are. And, and I've had so many moments in their lives when, I, when I've been so proud of them. And, and I've watched their concerts and sporting events and award ceremonies. And I'm just overflowing with love for them. Think about your proudest moment. That time when you knew you had the approval of family and friends and loved ones. And did you know that on your worst day, God's love for you is so much greater even than that. It's not just your best days that God says, yeah, you're good. But even on your worst days, he loves you more than you have ever been loved. And, and God's love is unconditional. It's not based on how good you've been. It's not based on whether you got everything right or not. It's not based on how many times you read your Bible this week. It's unconditional. God's love is inclusive. God's love is unconditional. But there's a third thought to look at today. And that's this. And that's the reality that for some of us, God's gift of love will remain unopened this Christmas season. That some folks will get through this whole season and we're not going to experience this love at the level that God wants us to. There are some of us that we, we've said yes to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and it's, but in this season, even in this season that we're supposed to be focused on Jesus, we're kind of just going through the motions. We're going to decorate. We're going to go to parties. We're going to buy gifts. But we're going to miss out on experiencing God's gift of love in all its fullness this Christmas. Others of us here today, we've gone our entire lives believing the lie that we are not worthy of this gift. That this gift does not have our name on it. So, so there's a danger that we could go through this season and not open this gift of love that God has for all of us because his love is inclusive and it's unconditional. So we have just uh, one more week before Christmas, what would it take for us to truly be ready? We talk about Advent as this season of, of preparation, of this time of, of getting ready. And, and I'm not talking about getting your Christmas shopping done. I'm talking about some, something so much more important. What, what do we need to do to really prepare our hearts to really experience God's love? It seems like uh, the more important the person that's coming, the more preparation is necessary. I heard this week about uh, all the preparations that um, had to go into a visit that the president made to Africa a couple of years ago. There were hundreds of Secret Service folks that arrived there ahead of time to kind of plan out the route and scout out the, the different places they were going to be. They had a Navy aircraft carrier positioned just offshore with a fully stocked and staffed trauma unit that was ready just in case something happened. They had military cargo planes that, that brought in 56 support vehicles, including 14 limousines and three trucks filled only with bulletproof glass that they they could put in, in the rooms where the president would be at any time. They had jets that were flying surveillance 24 hours a day over the president wherever he want, went. Man, you talk about preparation. In so many ways, the arrival of King Jesus could not have been any more different. He, he came in humble beginnings. Not a lot of fanfare. But the Bible does speak to some preparation that needs to happen on our part if we're going to fully receive and embrace the king. If we're going to receive his love, there's some preparation that we need to do. Several hundred years before Jesus came, Isaiah, who is a prophet, he wrote about the coming of the Messiah. And he gives us this warning. That, that He says that we need to prepare the way because he's coming. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 3, where it says, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys, level the mountains and the hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. Just like this prophecy spoke about what needed to happen to prepare the way for the Messiah to come, we need to use it as an analogy for the preparation 
that we need to make to get ready for King Jesus to come this Christmas season. We can look through this verse and we can find three things, three things that we need to address in our lives. The first thing that I need to address has to do with my valleys, my valleys. At the beginning of verse four, what did it say? It said, it said, fill in the valleys. What, what do the valleys represent in our lives? Maybe the valleys could represent um, unexpected loss. These, these, these low places in our lives that seem to be magnified this season, um, that, and, these, and it makes it difficult to face. For some, it may be the loss of a job. And with all of the gifts to buy and preparations to make, you just know it's not going to be the same as it has been in years past. It, it's a valley or a loss. For others, the valley that represents loss is going to be found in an empty seat around the table this year. Some of you have lost loved ones, and it's just not going to be the same. Some of us will try to uh, either ignore the valley or, or fill up the valley in unhealthy ways. We, we just want to cover it up or gloss over it, pretend it's not there. We try to numb it away, and so we're going to overeat, and we're going to overspend, and we'll drink too much. But, but Isaiah says that, that every valley should be filled up. What would it look like to address that valley in your life? I believe that one of the best ways that we experience God's gift of love for us is in those valleys. In those valleys, God's, God's grace and love is poured out to us. So, so we, we don't want to hide from the valleys. We, 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 have, to, we have to raise them up. And, and so maybe, maybe, maybe for you, you just need to name that valley, what it is. What, what is that loss that is bringing sadness to you this Christmas season? Second thing that we can make an analogy of preparation from these verses has to do with the mountains. The, the verse said that, that we need to level the mountains and hills. Now, the mountains could represent all sorts of different things in our lives. Um, it could be good things, but, but maybe it's something that's bringing about a sense of pride in our hearts. Uh, we we want to celebrate good things, but maybe it's become a little bit more about you and a little bit less about God. Uh, maybe the mountains could represent um, unexpected pressure. Unexpected pressure. Are you experiencing pressure this Christmas season? Man, this is the time for it. Pressure really seems to build up this time of year. Maybe you own or manage a business and, and there's, there's pressure to try to hit the, the numbers you need before the end of the year. As parents, we, we have this pressure to try to provide the best possible Christmas for our children and get them the perfect gift. We want it to be perfect. And, and maybe, maybe we've started comparing and we see what other folks are getting for their kids, and, and the pressure is building. What would it look like to, to level those mountains? To prepare our hearts for the coming of the king by addressing the mountain. Maybe the in-laws are coming for Christmas, and, and there's a lot of pressure to make things perfect. These, these mountains can be characterized by pressure or pride. How, how do we level the mountains? I think, again, some of it has to do with admitting it. Admit the pressure that you're under and, and surrender it to God. Bring it to him. Sometimes it's a matter of just bringing it to God and admitting that you don't have it all together. Again, that's one of the things that I love about Edgewater is, is that it's a safe place for people like me who don't have it all together. There, there's no expectation of having to have it all together before you come in the doors. So, so give it to God and begin to feel the pressure release and, and level that mountain. The third analogy that we can draw from these verses has to do with the rough places. The verse talks about the, the rough places being smoothed out. And maybe, maybe the rough places in this analogy could represent uh, unexpected emotions. Unexpected emotions. What, what emotion does this season bring out for you that may be unexpected? Maybe for you it's, it's anger. You're just kind of on the edge and you're ready to snap. Some may be dealing with bitterness or envy or fear or worry. What, what are these emotions that may normally lie just below the surface for you, but this season is really bringing it out? What is your rough place? If you can't name your rough place, I bet those closest to you can. You know, I, they, they may be walking around on eggshells. They, they may be trying... Trying, to, trying not to provoke you or say anything that might set you off. Is this rough place preventing you from experiencing God's gift of love for you? We need to be open about our, our valleys and our mountains and, and our rough places so that we can be fully open to receive 
God's gift of love this Christmas season. Because if we're not careful, the season could begin to be characterized by the valleys and the mountains and the rough places. And my prayer for us is that we would all be open to God's gift of love for us this Christmas season and fully receive the love that God has for us. And then be able to turn around and share that love with those around us. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this reminder of your love for us. God, this love that is inclusive, that has each and every one of our names on it, this love that is unconditional, that starts with you. It doesn't start with, with us or our behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't end because we do things wrong or because we run or because we put up walls. But God, you, can sit, you continue to pursue you continue to offer up your gift of love for us. And, and we just need to turn around and take that one step back to you. And, and it is right there for us. And so, God, for those who are going through the motions this Christmas season, I pray that uh, in this last week that we have of preparation, that you will uh, make your gift of love even more real to us. Maybe you're here today and... Uh, that idea of, of running from God and putting up those walls is right where you are. You've been doing that your whole life. And maybe today you've just realized you're tired. You're tired of running. You're tired of feeling that emptiness inside. And I am so glad that you're here today. Because today is the day that God's inviting you to, to stop running to tear down those walls and receive the gift of love that he wants to give you. So the way that we, we commemorate this, receiving this gift of love, saying yes to this relationship to God through Jesus, is we say a prayer, and I'm, I'm going to pray this prayer, and I invite you to pray it along with me. And so please, please pray with me as we pray. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Help me to receive your gift of love. And help me to share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen.